Alrighty. Good morning from um, me, from um, Bolelo, and from Pumi, who is just busy. She's, I don't know, she's boiling the kettle or something, but she's there. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Thursday, mini Friday this morning, and the end of a very short week. Hopefully a very good week. Hopefully things are, are getting even better and better as we head towards the end of the year. It's, uh, I've said it a million times, it's my favorite thing to watch September and October and November arrive. So good. And by the way, I was um, lambasted by Sean Sanders yesterday for being uh, for having jinxed the good luck of Bitcoin going up every time we speak to him. But you know what? It's up like uh, $2,000 in the last I don't know, 24 hours, something like that. It's at almost $44,080 now. So just a quick uh, reminder that I'm not always wrong and I'm not always jinxing things. So things are getting better again. Immediately well, although, the other problems. Sorry, um, Bolelo, you were going to say? No, I was saying people um, people that do jinx things are often the people that need to remind us that they don't jinx things just to be, you know, there just we to go. give it. Yeah, so... <laughs> The more you're telling us you're not a jinx, actually lets yeah. me know you've jinxed a lot. <laughs> yeah, you're probably 100% right. I should shut up. I should just shut up about it. That's what you do if you don't want to jinx things. You shut up. Uh, so I went to... Why are you jinxing? Uh, just uh, the price of Bitcoin. So I went to... <laughs> oh, Lord. I went to an event last night, um, which I haven't done in ages. Wasn't it awesome? It was so nice, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So it's something that um, one of our new clients are, are involved with, um, Adcock Ingram. They do um, something called the Sponsors of Brave, and they were they were giving journalists awards for having done incredible work over the last year. So it was a whole lot of people who I knew, um, Masaki Kana, who now works for Carte Blanche. Um, oh, really? I don't yeah, watch yeah. Cut Blanche. I didn't know she moved. Yeah, she's moved from EWN. She, in fact, I think she moved a couple of years ago already. But she's doing really well there. Um, I saw Katie Catapodis. I saw, um, well, Ashraf wasn't there. Ashraf Garda, who used to be at the at the SABC when I was there, and he's also just a terrific journalist. Um, I saw Fakir Hassan, who also used to be at the at the SABC. Um, who else did I see there? I saw mm. what's really great though about going to events because mm. I also went to one, to, to one a, a week or so ago is actually because it's been such a long time it's, yeah. it's actually it's great it's there yeah. was a time when events had become like oh god another one of those uh, I you know. used to avoid them like the plague oh my god but now it's like it's just rediscovering the joy and actually seeing other people and being well, in crowds. It. it was just fabulous, just in time for I, Christmas party season. I know. I, I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I did, but it was also at a spectacular venue. So they did it at the new Leonardo building, which you know is the tallest oh, wow. building in Africa. So the view from up there is just extraordinary. You can see, you can basically see all the way to Pretoria. And it was magic. And we went up for sundown, is it like 5.30? Then we went downstairs for supper. And then they had the awards show. It was quite a chilly night last night, though, I won't lie. It, it was colder than I expected because the day was so beautiful. I thought, well, the night's going to be warm. Luckily, I took a jacket along. But there were some people who were getting very cold. So here's what I, I need to know. Is there still a curfew? Eh. You know, so I came back before the curfew. Supposedly, it's at 11 o'clock. But I don't think anyone's paying attention. Although, because I, there was still a curfew when I went to the event, and it was so nice also that it just ended. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to complain about it, and I suddenly remembered, no, no, it's a blessing in disguise, because you could say, oh, there you go, you know, curfew, curfew just came up. So actually, it's a blessing. It's like, you have to get home before the curfew. It was awesome. Yeah. So it, it's like having the best of both worlds. You're mm. out and it's fun. And, yeah. and then you 
go home at a respectable hour. So when was the when was the last time you went to something like that? Because it was really they gave us dinner. There, there were there were awards. It was it was beautifully done. They they put it together. Free really, booze. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that stuff. There was some wine also, on the table. It was nice. <laughs> so lovely. Yeah. See and also because the, because we've all also learned now, you know, kind of with social distancing. Also, people are circumspect about like coming at you and like yes. hugging you, and it's yes. That's all a these big, things, all these such, things. <laughs> for me, you're right. Y'all you know? thought there was no silver lining to this Corona thing. I'm telling you now, like nobody's like rushing you and hugging and you're kissing so, you. You're so right. People are just like hi, you know, well, at a respectable it, 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 distance. It's wonderful. It, like everybody started, not everybody, because some people aren't as as uh, uptight about it as others. But I saw quite a lot of people had um masks on at the beginning and they were you know careful about not touching and there was elbow greetings and they, by the end of the night no one was wearing a mask um everybody was shaking hands or hugging and we were back to being normal human beings which i, <laughs> I have to say i kind of liked you know <laughs> um no really it was it, it made a shaking huge difference hands, because i really am not gonna miss shaking hands like i i know i know what you mean but it it was just it was good to see. I mean, listen, some of these people I've, I've known for years. I mean, um, you know, Katie Katapotis and Aki Anastasio and those people. So I've I've known them for years. So to shake to not hug and not shake their hands would be very weird. And as one person there, uh, you know, who else was there was uh, Bongani Bingwa. Um, oh. So it was nice. It was right. Dudu um, Dudu used to be Museneke. She's now Dudu. Akubu, I think, and she um, she used to be my producer on Seven O Two years ago. She's Ooh. Dikang Wasaneke's daughter. Yeah, I saw her. I haven't seen her in years. She's gone on to be unbelievably successful. She's got businesses all over the continent, and she's a real success story. So it was good to see Dudu as well. And the um, the Ndlovu Youth Choir were there, which was pretty oh, amazing. Oh wow! Yeah, and I haven't seen them in person ever, so it was really good to see them. So all, all in all, just a terrific experience from top to bottom. I'm very glad I went. Without hugs from people you hated, it sounds like a perfect evening. That's the really thing. Does. Like hugging people that that you like is a different thing. But there was a time in the end there before the corona where everybody, yeah. it was just like everybody wanted to hug. <laughs> hugging yes. your people is okay, but just like strangers. <laughs> yeah. But you can still, now you can use that excuse. See, so you don't have to hug anybody you don't want to hug. But I must tell you, the view from up there on, on the top of that building, so it's 57 floors up. And I actually met the, the guy who, who built it, the developer. 57 wow. floors, Pums. And the views are breathtaking. It's the, it's the highest bar in South Africa, too. So if you, you can now go there for drinks. Is it open um, to the public? It is. It is. Oh. Where know. is it? It's it's right in Maud Street. So you know where um, I think. You know where the the what's that uh, fancy new place called the uh, where they've got Saint Restaurant and all that stuff. You just oh, carry like on. A little bit. No, no, Saint. Yeah, in the Santa. city. In the city. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And in the uh, let me see, city. I want to show you this picture quickly. Let's see if I can put it up here. Of the the the, the view is just extremely beautiful. Anyway, well, while I'm trying to load that up. So you just go further along Maud Street, and it's basically um, on your way towards Sandton City on Maud Street. It's it's on your right hand side. What a All place! Right. Are there like what apartments a- in there? I mean, what are we talking about? Yes. So they've got they've got penthouses. Nice. There are eight yes. penthouses that sell for something in the twenty million. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. <laughs> and then they've got one called the Leonardo Suite, which has apparently got. Windows all around, so you you have a completely uninterrupted view of Johannesburg, and that one's super expensive. I don't know what that costs. No, Oprah you, already you, owns it. Don't even worry about it. You, 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 like it's the Oprah don't know suite. Don't worry about it. You think so? Think yeah, or like someone like that. Like it's probably oh, it's uh, like, owned. <laughs> who's the pastor guy? The, the the guy who's just smoking it in America right now. The oh. guy with the whitest teeth in the world. 
Uh, Joel Osteen. Is Joel that the guy Osteen. you see? Shout out my guy. He needs to be able to see, he because yeah. he needs to be able to see Jesus and Jesus needs to be able to see him if it's just windows the whole right. time. Shout Absolutely. out Joel Austin. He's just rocking, no towel, yeah. just walking around, meat swinging. Hey. hey. Speaking of that. I'm not just speaking talk? about, no. No, we've no. got, because I didn't know about this no. until yesterday. It all happened yesterday. Okay, so I only found out last night. I had no idea. But let me tell you, I'm quite this, horrified. This is uh, no. you, you, you know what we're talking about, right? Mbulelo, you sure you know what's going on? No. So, <laughs> Richard Spur. Richard Spur is he's a, a famous lawyer. Okay, in South Africa. He's, a, he's a very well-known lawyer. He's very loud and vocal about things on Twitter. Okay. And exposing and, people. And, and exposing, exposing people. Things. Exposing, it, yes, it, <laughs> he likes an oh expose. Okay. Anyway, there's a picture of him. Did he post it for me? Because I can't remember the details. Listen, it, it was all just, you, you know that moment where you, you see something and you, you can't unsee it? And, and it's, I don't know if he posted it because by the time I saw it, it was deleted off his timeline. But yeah. other people, because for some odd reason, there are people on that Twitter that are just waiting to screen munch everything in case everything. it gets deleted later and they put it that's, out there. That's so amazing. Is that they can find a thing if you delete it, even if you delete, delete it a second after you've posted it. So you've got to be really careful what you post because you won't be able to call it back. Uh, that, so Richard so, work. he posted this picture of him with only a jacket on. And his and member. All his tackle, like out there, <laughs> with the cup of coffee in his hand. Yeah. What intentionally? Just well. So someone must have taken the picture because he couldn't have taken it himself. Yeah, because it's also at at a kind of a low angle. Low so he's, angle. He's big and imposing in the foreground. You see the man, the manhood. <laughs> the manhood is is there for all to see. So I had no idea this. This was they were talking about it last night because obviously there are a lot of journalists there, so they pay attention <laughs> to social media, right? And all of them were laughing, and I said, "What is going on?" So then somebody showed me the picture. Oh. Jesus, it's so embarrassing. I mean, like, you know, I've often he, said on the show that we'll we'll all end up naked on the internet one day, right? Richard's was also not a young person. No, no. And and he's outside. Like, there's so many things. There's so many questions about that image. Who takes an image like this? But who goes outside without pants on? Oh. <laughs> And Basitsana, Basitsana says, and he was hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Oh, let me just let me see the, these views quickly. Just look at this. So that, <sighs> that, is, that is the view to the south, uh, to the north. So you can almost pick out like Midrand. You can definitely see the Midrand uh, PWC building there in the middle. And then it, you can almost see all the way to Pretoria. And then this one's the view to the south. Um, there's the, the sand, city. There's the city. It, it's a beautiful view. huh? And yesterday was a pretty clear day, but I think you can even get better. And, and I mean, for our international listeners, it is important for them to give them some perspective. You, you know, we were just saying, Santon, they're, 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 for them, that could be at the bottom of a river or in a crocodile's mouth. But it is where <laughs> the <laughs> ultimate douchebags of all douchebaggery uh, live it's like your sort of hustling like you. bustling you, you sort of bankers insane. you live uh, well it's not a this is not about you me do. yes you do <laughs> everything's about you this is not about me eventually but yeah, it's your banker hungry i want to get at him and he's got the classic you know girlfriend who's blonde and they all look the same and they all go to the same pubs and drink shit whiskey uh, wh like whatever if it wasn't for those people we wouldn't have an economy so that's not i have no too. problem with them no, 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 no. Please, no. I'm just giving people an insight into the Harvey Specter types that live there, you know, or, or at least trying to imitate Harvey Specter with a watch not, they can't afford. It sounds like you're a little bit bitter. I mean, if I'm being very honest. Hey, Pums? Not at all. Not at all. I've lived that life of trying to pretend I've got money. No, thanks. Maybe you want to be rich. Maybe you want to be rich like Richard Spoor, where you can put your 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 hard member on on <laughs> the internet and people. Now, I don't know. How do you come back from that? Like, how do you keep so this is also the thing is he then just went quiet no kind no 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 statement no nothing he just 
went quiet and the whole day he was trending the entire day <laughs> of all the things that were happening yesterday the one thing that kept coming back into people's timelines was richard spur oh poor man and is he like Listen. proper big time like he he'd be he's, like doing he, he's a serious guy Yes. So when wow. I when I saw when I first saw him trending on the list because this is how I got to see it it was on the trending list and I I wonder what is Richard Spur part of the Afri Forum Western Cape Secession battle right because that's the first thing I thought about oh yeah 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 and then the second thing that that I saw was LLB Twitter now when you see LLB Twitter hashtag LLB Twitter trending you know something's going down now I wondered is it about Dalim Bofu but no it was all about Richard Spur <laughs> <laughs> well this this picture is just so embarrassing and um, I don't know how you come back from it so if anyone has any suggestions as to what he should do in order to because now your credibility is slightly you know slightly ruined for for a very long time <laughs> And it, that's just the thing also about Twitter is that this this internet, guys, we must all be careful. It's going to be everybody's downfall. But like... That's but a Richard I, I don't, story. Oh, Richard. <laughs> I oh, didn't recognize it. I think that's a hair piece. It's not a hair no, piece. No, that's not his real hair. It's, it's not, not. It's not a it's hair not piece. His, oh, that's Richard. That's not no, the picture. But that that's good old Dick. That's yeah, good but his hair, that's definitely a hair piece. Shout out to him. It is My thing is, though, maybe we're just being too sensitive to it, is that with porn now, is you, you know, people, like, we're so taken aback. Like, oh, he was naked. But people are yeah, looking at porn now. It's available. Yeah. People are doing that in meetings. Like, like no. maybe nudity isn't as offensive it's as off brand. It's off-brand. It's <laughs> oh, okay. off-brand. It's off-brand. So it's <laughs> not like you've gone into OnlyFans and found, like, you know, Richard Spoor's secret passion. This is, like, someone who's been taken very seriously as a lawyer for a very long time he's fought some ambitious projects against gold mining you know businesses and uh he, he's he's won against um americans he's he, a he's a real he's a serious guy he's, yeah. he's he really yeah. isn't a popeye so mm -hmm. don't like but this yeah, thing I, is, I, this thing has got him more attention from people than any of his legal activities beforehand. <laughs> That's for sure. I'm looking forward. Like if he's this uh, as big time as you're saying, I'm looking forward to the next like board meeting where they all meet. You know, you know, is uh, all right, guys. Um, on the docket today is obviously the acquisition and merger of Bank Six Three Six. That'll be about four billion dollars. Uh, the, the the next one is an American oil deal, eighteen billion dollars. Uh, congratulations to Michelle on closing that one. And we do yeah. have a spore dick here. Spore dick. Here. That's the final. The final uh, thing on the agenda for this morning is uh, the, the spore dick. Let's talk about that. But really, I mean, good God! No, so, so you had lots of people posting hilarious things, like really hilarious uh, comments of posting pictures of like dicks and all kinds of things that were. It's not going to go away in a hurry. This no, just, this thing was South Africa. South Africa's like humor at its best. Cause this is the other thing that South Africans do extremely well is make yeah. fun of yes. people and each other. The entire day, people had all sorts of puns. People mm -hmm. reminded him of all sorts of moments when he, uh, he posted a picture. You, you remember when everyone was going to Mkandla for tea? Yes. There was, a, there was that picture with, with, um, with Dali yeah. Bofu, yeah. with the, just a whole bunch of them and Julius and whatever. And he posted, you know, that double pick with the guys and a bunch of bananas. And he said, and he put a caption that says, can you identify, caption these pictures? I'll help you. The one is a bunch of bananas and the other. And yeah. so like people just. They were nailing him. Like, how's your banana now? <laughs> it's amazing uh good for him good for him uh, you, you know most guys never hear this but no guy just because of gravity looks as good as like a woman naked is an awesome sight not because i'm saying it's an attractive thing it's for yeah. guys if you're meeting yeah. veggies it, like, like nobody looks no guy looks good <laughs> and also there's there are no women lining up to see the meat and veg you know like a yeah. guy will do anything for a nude pic of a girl there's no 
it's very few people. Let's not say no. It's very few people who are that interested in seeing the tackle from a dude, mm. and especially a dude who's I don't know how old Richard is now, late fifties, early sixties, maybe. And and people have been commenting in our comments too, saying it's not that uh, it's not a it's not a small package. He doesn't have anything to be embarrassed about, but that doesn't help. Good for him. So, so the, then you know this was always true from all the way back then when we got all our gossip from newspapers. Mm. If you don't want to see it in the paper, just don't do it. Yeah. Also, if you don't want to see it on the internet, don't take the pic. Wow, don't so take weird, the it's picture. A weird sort of pic to because it's not like he's in. You remember Kebi Mapatswe also had. There was Your. That. <laughs> <laughs> that was embarrassing too, because Kebby had like, you know, one arm and his his dick, and he was like with some prostitute or something. Anyway, that was a, obviously in a sexual situation. This is weird because it's Richard Spoor standing with a, he's got only a jacket on, all the stuff's hanging out at the bottom, and he's holding a mug of coffee and he's staring into the distance. So someone thought this is a this is a cool picture. And and he he had that picture on his phone. Yeah. How do we don't know? We don't know this. No. We don't know what of, happened there. Yeah, the, that's the what I'm saying. The truth of the is, matter is, is just don't take the picture. Think well, is he married? married? I because if we I don't, don't know, know if your we wife don't know is this taking about that him. kind of picture, that, that's what I'm saying. Is I just hope for his sake he's not married because that type of picture I haven't seen it yet. But your wife's not taking that picture. Why Just, not? Sorry, Why not, not after 40 years. Ah, come on, guys. Let's be serious. Don't, all we... I'm saying is don't take the picture. If you don't want to see it on the internet, don't take the picture, guy. Don't take the picture. I think it's, you know, it's, I'm, it's I know this it's might it's be uh, wrong to say, but it maybe it's side blade Diake and they were having fun. I just hope that he's not maybe. in a situation further than just the picture. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm not saying it's true. Allegedly, I've just made that up. So could it could be that. <laughs> Ruth, so Ruth wants to know how would I handle it or, or how would you guys handle it? So now Pumi's right. Obviously, you know, in an ideal situation, you don't um, end up with your pictures like that anywhere, anyway. But I I don't know. I mean, I think the best thing to do is kind of laugh it off. You have to just, you can't take it seriously because no one else is. <laughs> so you just have to laugh yes. it off. I, I think you double down and you go, yeah. <laughs> Double that's down. Mine. That's mine. It's <laughs> that's it. I am the big swinging dick of law. That's what you. That's what you say. <laughs> you, I'd, I'd like lean into it. You just lean yeah, into you it. Compete. You say yes. My name is Richard. That is the short yeah. word for Richard is dick. But I don't have anything short on me, as you can tell by the picture. Yes, that's and me. I am the big swinging <laughs> dick of law in South Africa, and I'm proud of it. And and screw you. You want to screw me? I know you do. That's why you're talking about my neck. You want to screw me? Screw you. I'm here. I'm proud. I'm Richard Spur. I would change the name of my attorney's firm to Dick Spur. Dick. Because then people have like that because they're expecting you to be embarrassed and humiliated and all of this stuff. But now it's out there. It's like it's kind of a it's almost a freedom to it for him now. He doesn't. Now he's like, yeah, because you remember the spear, the the um, it's interesting spur and spear, but the Jacob Zuma <laughs> painting was it wasn't. We don't know that that's actually how Jacob Zuma looked naked, but that painting was a hugely controversial thing at the time. But what it did, listen, it, it kind of added to Jay Z uh, Jacob Zuma's uh, machismo. You know, it, it it gave him even more of that kind of <laughs> I don't give a fuck attitude. Well, so, it certainly did for uh, what's his name, uh, our former minister of finance, Gigaba. Gigaba, exactly. Look at how that worked out for him. No one's talking about his dick that much anymore. It was it was all the, the rage for a while, but you know, at those state capture hearings, no one was really reminded of those. Reminding things. him, but and that's so. That is the one good thing about the internet is that it is mm. a like a eight hour news cycle. It blows right. by, right? So yep. like today, I think other than us, I don't think anybody else is going to be having this conversation. But And no, well, also, also because also, everybody wants to be in it quickly. Everybody wants to be part of the in crowd very quickly. First to mm -hmm. see, first to hear, first to say anything about it. And then, then it trickles away. 
Yeah, a lot of people are agreeing. Double down, slap it round and round, says Ruth. Uh, Robert says, uh, definitely have to own it. He will be respected for it. Yeah. <laughs> and especially if he's saying he's operating uh, machinery that would need a code 14. Shout out to him. You know what I mean? Yeah, if, he's, sure. if he's pushing some heavy artillery there, yeah. go with it. I, I'm Dick Spoor and I've got balls. Yeah. Like a, you need a lawyer? Yeah. Come to me. Um, and and uh, Justice Lissilo says, it's poor net, not the internet. <laughs> I like that. I'm listening from Germany, says JKS. I'm listening from Germany. If it happened here, that dude's career would probably be over for a good while. Well, I don't know, JKS, because in Germany, you people, I'm speaking about the Germans, obviously. I don't know if you're a South African in Germany or if you're a German. But you Germans, if you are German, you guys lie in the park with your tackle out in on a sunny day all through summer. You don't care about <laughs> nudity. Germans don't give a shit about nudity. And they are loosey goosey with it within the what are we doing in the whole like, like uh, don't please do not let the we're on time thing. I guarantee you. So, I can only speak for Stuttgart where my dad lived. Uh, they are loosey goosey with it. We 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 can <laughs> yeah we can swap saliva mm -hmm. and. Yeah, other yeah, yeah. stuff and yeah they they are about it they are uh, German, the German, <laughs> yeah. they're not as they're yeah. not as prudish as south africans because we really mm. are we're very conservative oh. and and beyond we are beyond conservative what's what's gareth doing gareth you can hear sure. me properly you can hear yes, me yes we can now, now. okay i was You're worried back, about yeah. what was because uh, i was trying to re Established a connection yet yeah, didn't seem like it was working properly. Yes, anyway, so was so, he, he was also trying to <laughs> establishing a connection, re establish a connection. Yeah, uh, Freedom Fighter says, uh, Game Rangers have a new sport to track. <laughs> 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 wow, uh, Jesus, but it is, it is funny that he's this, um, he's this incredibly like serious lawyer. I mean, that's what I think. I think that's the problem. <clears throat> Off brand. Also, yeah, he's been he's been throwing barbed comments at everyone else, right? So now you now you understand. Sure, yeah, and like two days ago or something, he put out on his Twitter. It's always on his Twitter that he's like exposing little things. He put a, a picture and of an aerial view of a humongous house, and yeah. and I think he said it's Robert Gumeta's house or something. Yes. So maybe maybe you know maybe the man was hacked. And he was just being Maybe. like, they were getting him back. But that's mm. all the more reason why he should lean into it. If it's if it is someone trying to pull him down, you know, you never allow extortion. If someone tries to extort you, let them say to them, "All right, take whatever you think you've got to the press." Because unless you've done something really criminal and really evil, and there's a huge difference <laughs> between something embarrassing and something criminal, yeah, you mustn't let people take your money and screw with you and mess with your. Your, mm. your your path in life because if they do that once they'll do it again also if you let someone extort you or force you into a situation where you're giving them something um in order to not have them tell a story or to not publish something how do you know That's, that they're not you give do that it again? thing too much power you give it but too also, much power you pay them the once but then they'll come back to you and say mm, it's time for the second payment and then the third and the fourth so if someone extorts you just say go for it that's good advice all through in any situation. Um, Carl DeSantis says, the penis is so ugly, though. Why is there no famous vagina being leaked? Uh, well, I think there is. You've got to pay I for think. that. <laughs> you got to pay for that. That doesn't just yeah. happen. But, but on a serious note is that, you know, within the South African landscape, you can see is, hey, Dickie boy, you'll be all right, mate, because – you know, look at old Gatlejo. He's back now. Like, mm -hmm. and that was that was, I would say, as bad. You know, like his lady standing there turning him into a mouse. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? On screen, he's back. So, Dicky boy, you'll be you'll be all right. I mean, right as so you know, he's back. Um, Malusi Gigaba survived his. The, ah. the reason he the reason he didn't survive long term was because <clears throat> he was eventually fired from cabinet. But I don't think. I mean, Bill Clinton. You know. Look at Bill Clinton. Yeah, they still they still wheel him out at the Democratic National Convention and when there are elections on, because he's still popular with people. Yeah, uh, Tiger's uh, back. Bill, I had sex with a whole lot of interns, and I'm still the most popular guy in the Democratic Party besides Barack. 
and he is. So, I mean, I got a picture of me with Bill Clinton somewhere here. Oh boy, what, yeah. did he try it on you as well, or not? I did not have <laughs> sexual relations with him. No, uh, what I'm saying is that I I met him at a at a tribute to Madiba in 2014. And I was pleased to have a photograph with Bill. I wasn't thinking, oh, this is the, the uh, you know, the guy who forced himself on interns. I was like, this is the former president of the United States. So it depends on also what people rank in their heads as being important and what they don't. Also, and if you Richard still... is not that guy, right? He's not that no. guy that when you saw him in the pick and pay, you'd recognize him. Very few mm. people would actually no. recognize him. Definitely not. <laughs> independently Definitely. so unlike a malusi who when you see him you're still like a little That's bit minister, you know yeah. kind of right. see him <laughs> and, he, and, and he's out here by the way old uh, malusi I, I i've seen him twice now at uh, a shopping center up the road where, where all of our government money gets spent with the galanda wagons i i just oh, yeah. no, he's out like out here just living so definitely <clears> be all right mate yeah, I think he'll be fine. Anyway, it's just funny. And and I can't believe we've spent this much time talking about it this morning. So let's just... <laughs> we had to tackle the matter. Through. Yesterday, we had two um, guys on when Dumi Morake was on the show with us yesterday. We had two guys on who made a student film. And it raised a question in my head. Are cinemas back? Are they open? Are they ever going to pick up again? Yes. <laughs> we, I don't they know are. if they're going to pick up again, but they're back. Mm. We went to see... What is it? The the Marvel film with the girl. Oh, Could be anything. Which was it packed? Is. No, we were the only two people in the cinema. It was awesome. But no, that's why I'm going to survive for you and Canejo, but no one else <laughs> is going. <laughs> no, but <laughs> actually, people, listen, uh, although having said that, right, yeah. worldwide, the cinema is actually making a comeback. They're making some serious wow. Tom in those box office. Huh, okay. And they're I, making I, some serious time in those box offices. It's just cinema in South Africa has been on the decline for a very, very long time. People have been okay. TVs in their houses. <laughs> I want to believe you. I'm I'm hoping so because I, I like the cinema experience, especially for a big movie, you know, like a big action movie like or the new James movie. Bond. Yeah, with the, those kinds of things you want to see on the big screen. You never watch it on your stupid cell phone or in your in your bed and your laptop, you know. Um, so let me just quickly throw this in here because we've got some news stories. So Donald Trump has sued his niece and the New York Times over a tech story. Now, this is the Mary Trump who I interviewed on my TV show last year. Um, apparently, he's going after her. He said that um, she is lying about his dubious tax schemes. So he's filed a lawsuit accusing Mary Trump and newspaper reporters of being engaged in an insidious plot to obtain confidential documents. It alleges that Mary Trump, 56, breached a settlement agreement, barring her from disclosing things like that. In response, she said the lawsuit was a sign of desperation. The walls are closing in and he's throwing up anything against that wall that will stick, she told the Daily Beast. As is always the case with Donald, he'll try and change the subject. Ms. Trump revealed herself as the source of the story in a tell-all memoir in 2020. So he's like, well, Mary, I gave you some money. Because you to poor, shut up, <laughs> yeah, and and now, and now you you're talking, so you've broken the terms of our agreement. So I want my money back. I'm going to sue you. So that's what's going on there. But you know, it's she's really uh, not very nice about him. I mean, she she came on my show and she lambasted the man. She's got no love for her uncle, and um, and I, I have to also say that I don't think he ever mentioned he even had a niece called Mary Trump until she came forward with a tell-all memoir, but. I hope there's no one in my family who, if I become important one day, will suddenly go running around to the newspapers trying to tell them how what an awful person I am. I don't mind if there's a member of the family who goes around saying nice things, um, but you know, if, if there's some if there's some shitty cousin or second cousin or great uncle who's suddenly going to run around saying, "Oh yeah, that Gareth, he's really mean with his money," or Oh, he's always been nasty to my aunt Zelda or whatever. I'll, I will be furious with that person because I can't think of anyone right now who, who's close enough to tell those stories. But if they, you know, you always wonder: is there someone in the family who's just a, a shithead who would climb on the bandwagon and start doing a Richard Spur on you? <laughs> huh? Oh, is that what they're calling it already? 
I'm funny enough. Anyway. <laughs> Mary Trump. I mean, really, like Mary Trump. She was never important before. Now she, she's suddenly important. That's awesome. Oh, but you know it. By what the way, is, no one no one would be listening to her if she was saying nice things, right? But you know what is quite lovely about the States is there is always a family member willing mm. to be out there yeah. <laughs> on everyone. It's like this True. the story that of the YouTuber who's now been found dead. The you know the story, right? No. Tell us. So YouTube couple, um, th their thing's called the van life or something. A couple of days mm. ago, so last week it was quite a, a, a developing story. She went missing <clears throat> and he was the main suspect of, <clears throat> you know what happened. Also because there was video footage of them having a fight and there was a, a, a ranger who had seen them and their van parked wherever and they were having a fight, kind of broke up a fight between the two of them. And then a couple of days later, he went missing and everyone kind of, then it became, you know how it gets in America. Everybody was like, okay, he killed her wow. and now he's run. He was the person of interest and then he went missing. Nobody could find him. Sure. One of his aunts came out, spoke yeah. to the newspapers saying, that boy, he was always so mean to her. He was always <laughs> abusive oh, and so mean. Oh my God. <laughs> Rahadi, Rahadi. <laughs> but she was missing. So she still hadn't been found. No body, no. And a couple of days ago, I think on Monday, they found her body. And he's Ooh, still he's still able. So that's a Rahadi, right? That yeah. yeah. He's, that's what that is. Uh, and, and then the rest of the family come out because I don't know how they do it in these American uh, news outlets, right? Because they always kind of know how to keep ramping up, keep ramping up the story. Then the aunt came out. He was so terrible. And then uh, the other family members. So now there's a whole bickering between family members while there's this manhunt now for him. I haven't for seen him today, them. so I don't know if, if they found him today or yesterday. Jeez. For all of their downside, you know, the royal family's got it right in this sense back in the day. It's why it was so important to know what your blood was back in the day so we can yeah. keep you in-house and we can keep you <laughs> order, order, order. Mm. Here's some money to shut up and go live in the country, you know? Like, so right, maybe, they would, maybe or, they, or in the days of Henry VIII, they'd cut your head off if you became yeah. uh, annoying. Probably yeah, the best were, way. You, Inconvenient. Yeah, I'm, I'm the real king. Off with their head. That's what they used to do. So, so to create your utopia, Gareth, are you thinking maybe you open up a bank account where you, you kind of just feed uh, 1500 bucks into all family members' accounts to keep them cushy, no, just in case? Not a chance. I'd rather go with the chopping the head off part. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no. All right. I, if I were the king, I would be cutting off heads. I wouldn't be paying people off. Off with their heads. Mm -hmm. I'd say, you know what? If you don't shut up, Aunt Margaret... You're going to find yourself in a shallow grave. <laughs> Rahadi, listen, you shut up, Rahadi. Otherwise, you are going into the chopper. Yeah. Incredible. It's not going to go well for you. You know, that's the kind of king I'd be. Anyway, um, so a couple of news stories that we could look at. The Zondo Commission has backed off from challenging Jacob Zuma's medical parole. <laughs> surprise, surprise. It's great to be powerful and influential here. It's great to be one of those people who gets treated. I, I brought this up on, was it Monday or Tuesday? Could even, yeah, could even been yes, yesterday. Um, I said, if Pumi or if Mbulelo or if I stole money, even if it was 500 rand from a bank, you know, we'd go straight to jail and we'd be put in the cell with all the other prisoners. There'd be no special treatment. If you coughed and you said you had COVID, they wouldn't give a shit. It would be too bad for you. Jacob Zuma goes to jail. And I've heard from at least five different sources who are much more credible than I am that he hasn't spent a single night in jail. He's been in like a very nicely furnished apartment, being treated like the special person he is, the former president. He's had visitors whenever he wanted them. He hasn't eaten the prison food. All of that stuff, right? And now he gets medical parole as his excuse. And we know that the president 
must have had some oversight in this because there's no way that correctional services wouldn't have brought this to the president's attention. Old Arthur, what's his name? The guy who was named in Fraser. that book. Arthur Fraser. The guy who's like the arch crook in that book of, um, what's his name? Yeah, yeah. Myberg, yeah, um, uh, Jean-Louis Myberg, or whatever his name is, the guy who wrote the book about state capture. He said that the this Arthur Fraser men, is, president's keepers. That's right. That's it. That guy said that this Arthur Fraser is a crooked, <laughs> wicked, state apparatchik of a man, and everybody wants to blame him. But Cyril must have known. So I don't buy that at all. Do you think Cyril would ever hear about any of the three of us going to jail? Not a chance. Do you think we'd get medical parole? Not a chance. Do you think we'd be put in a nicely furnished apartment instead of having to go to a jail cell? Not a chance. So I'm sick of this whole... And a drug dealer gets into more trouble than a guy who's stolen billions and billions and billions of rands. Makes me sick. Sunder Commission. Now they've backed off. They're like, well, we're not going to challenge this thing. There they go. We've decided it's not necessary to look into his medical parole. Well, the people of this country still want to know, is he really sick? Is there something wrong with him? Or is this just bullshit that gets thrown up at us every time someone... Do we, this though? Happened? Do we? We Do don't we know. Though? We don't Do know. We? But you remember, want to know? The, remember with the TRC, Magnus Malan was too sick to go and testify, or he just outright refused. It was one of the others, Adrian Flock or one of them, who just refused because they weren't feeling well. Shabir Sheikh didn't feel well, so he got medical parole. If you're political, you're safe in South Africa. The, the lesson that we must take away from this as ordinary citizens is steal more and get into politics if you want to get away with it. Otherwise, you're going to go to jail. You're going to be in trouble. So well done there to uh, President Zuma. Another victory over the morons who can't challenge him or who are too, too afraid to. And then uh, speaking of court victories, the Supreme Court of Appeal has ruled that the tourism minister was incorrect to rule that tourism businesses meet broad-based black empowerment, uh, black economic empowerment. That's triple BEE because, you know, we need the more letters it has, the more important it is. Requirements if they're going to qualify for government's COVID-19 relief fund. So this was always something that bothered me a little bit. Like if your <coughs> business has suffered because of COVID rules, it shouldn't matter whether you're black or white, right? I know that sounds like a Michael Jackson song. But believe it or not, we're still talking about this so many years later. Hee hee. Hee hee. So in April last year, government announced relief of 200 million rand for once-off payments to businesses who were affected by closure due to the lockdown. And then they decided that not everyone qualified under the triple BEE requirements. So the Solidarity Trade Union and Afri Forum took them to court and they won. So well done to those guys. We're either going to be a racist country or we're not. We can't change the rules and give it a different name and call it. This. If businesses have suffered and people have lost their jobs and they need relief because of COVID, COVID doesn't care whether you're black or white and neither should the government. So well done to, to those guys there for challenging that. And then this is a pretty bizarre story. Section 10 of the Birth and Death Registration Act is apparently nasty to unmarried fathers. This is according to the Concord, so they're going to change it. So the Concord has declared Section 10 of that Birth and Death, Death Registration Act, which does not allow an unmarried father to register his child's birth under his surname, unless the mother is present or gives consent, unconstitutional. So in other words, so far, and in a country where we've got lots of um, unmarried parents who are having kids and lots of fathers who are absent, if you were a mom and you had a kid, you would have to register your child like any parent has to register their child. And you could determine what the child's surname was without the father being present because you're not married and the father wasn't there, right? Also because you are there giving birth. Cor correct. Yeah, correct. So, I mean, up to now, that's been the rule. Now they say, oh, but that impairs the dignity of the unmarried father. So now he can register the child too under his surname with the mother. So tell me how that's going to work out. That's the going good to be thing fun. is he has to be there, but that yeah, but he has fight. to be there. He has to be there. Yeah. So <laughs> apparently there's no justification for differentiating between married and unmarried fathers. Um, so they're now going to allow the act to be uh, declared invalid and inconsistent. And the uh, mother can 
can register the kid, but if the child, if the father's there, the, they can take the father's surname as well. Do you like that? Do we think that's a good thing? Positive development. So confusing. I don't, I don't. I'm not sure. I, I haven't taken all of it <laughs> in. I'm I'm not too sure what's going on there. Why? Yeah. What? I don't know. I don't. I wish I had answers for you, but you know, you. I'm just going to confuse you and me and everybody else some more. This is the weird thing about living now in this time and place, is that the whole way we defined and constituted families before has been changed and you've got to embrace the change i suppose uh, because there is no such thing as the old nuclear family but you also have to figure out new ways of of working out who belongs to who you know which kid is is which parents kid hey look at that this is you're dressing up for heritage day heritage day dress up <laughs> let's see can we see the whole outfit come, just uh, show us on. again there we come go. Stand here. Canejo's all dressed up. That is fantastic. <laughs> so obviously representing the Zulu very uh, very effectively there. Yes, he also has a fake spear to take with him. Brilliant. So you remember you remember the days where you would be arrested for traditional weapons, Pums? Remember? <laughs> remember when they, they were trying to shut the IFP down in the hostels? Yeah, hey, those were scary times. Those were scary times, Gareth. Those were scary yeah. times. And if you were found with a with a, even a sharp knife in your bag, they could arrest you in the, in the, the 90s for carrying a traditional weapon. And I'll never forget, like there were housewives driving around in their cars with knives in their doors saying, but it's my traditional weapon. <laughs> 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 really? And you're like, oh, yeah. You, you yeah. descended straight from Lady Macbeth, are you? That's where you get your traditional weapon. <laughs> but uh, Canejo yeah. looks great. That's so yeah. nice. He's got a little like shield and spear. This like heritage day dress up is always, always such a fascinating experience here in this house. Yeah. Um, Dogoza says, so that BEE story was a real thing. It's so ridiculous. I ridiculous. thought it was fake news. It is ridiculous. So Dogoza agreeing that's silly. Beth says, fathers have always been allowed to register as the father with his surname as long as both parents are at home affairs. So I don't understand this law. Um, it's it's about the, the the marriage thing. So in the old days, marriage was the differentiator. So if you were an unmarried father, you couldn't do it, I'm afraid. So now you can, as an unmarried father, you can your child can have your surname. Um, sure. Like like many things, like like many of these rules that are that on paper look mm. like such a great equalizer can be an absolute nightmare absolute yeah. nightmare so if you want to get a passport for your child yeah. mm -hmm. if you want to i mean i don't know if anybody still remembers there was the whole thing about getting like unabridged birth certificates this again we have our wonderful uh, gigaba based on his own personal feuds by the way that this oh. became a thing you have to have like the full birth certificate with the name of the both parents. And if the one parent is traveling with the child, then the other parent needs to give consent and you have to have the consent with you. And it's a mess. So it, yeah. it looks on paper, it looks great. Everybody's got their rights kind of looked after. But it but is a mess. Fuck the logistics of it. You can't get, mm. uh, so I can't get a passport for Ganejo. We have to. No, and I have to both be at home affairs. Both parents have to come to home affairs <clears throat> so that he can get a passport. Like, but at, at least in your situation, you and Neo still get along. But in other families, yeah, like the but, parents don't talk to each other. They don't even live in in the same country anymore. In the same you city, actually, in the same country. Oh. But also, just the scheduling thing, right? So you you know what trying to get to home affairs is. Like, oh my so, god, now two you know, people have to be. There. I have the two hours, but no, actually, you both have to have the two hours, you both have to sit there in the queue. You both, it's mm -hmm. a nightmare. No, that's that's horrendous. So, listen, we've got the burning platform coming up just now, which I'm very excited about this morning. We will be joined by Ray Hartley, someone who Pumi has been trying to get on the show for us for a long time, and she's finally succeeded. He's the research director of the Brenthurst Foundation and a well known journalist in South Africa for many years. He's edited several prominent newspapers and online publications. 
He's the author of Ragged Glory, The Rainbow Nation in Black and White, which tells the story of the first two turbulent decades in South Africa's democracy. He also wrote The Big Fix, which is um, a book on how South Africa stole the 2010 World Cup and most recently Ramaphosa, the man who would be king. So this I'm is the one we this is the one we're most interested in in the yes. turbulent times we live in now. The man Definitely. knows everything there is to know about the man. That's right. So I'm very excited to have Ray Hartley on the show a little bit later on. And I've also got a clip which comes from 2017, but I want to play it quickly for you now. It's a clip of Khalema Mutlante, and it's been doing the rounds again because the election's coming up. And at the time, this didn't really get a whole lot of traction in South Africa, but it was from BBC Hard Talk. And it's exactly three, yeah, three years ago, four years ago. So it's a while ago now. But here's Khalema Mutlante at that stage saying what he thought the ANC needed to learn. Remember, he's still a respected elder in the ANC, right? Oh, no, still... Wait, before you play the clip, he's not just a respected elder in the ANC. He is actually the person who is to blame for all the lists not going in, in time. He is that's the person correct. who is... And, and that's why this is doing the rounds again, because he is also the person that's been making quite a lot of sounds about the demise of Lutuli House and what needs to be re-corrected. Listen to this quickly. The, the ANC has the possibility to renew itself, but that would take lots of courage. And failing that, mm. it has to hit rock bottom. It has to lose elections for a penny to drop. Would you like and, to see, and, hang on, that's so important, would you like to see the ANC lose the next election? Would it be good for South Africa if it lost the next election? For as long as it is associated with corruption and failure, people will vote it out. Would it be good for South yeah. Africa it if would, it were voted out? It will be good for the ANC itself. And if for the, the people of your country. Out, because let me tell you why. Because those elements who are in it for the largesse, will quit, will desert it. And only then would the possibility arise for, you know, salvaging whatever is left of it. You seem to be telling me if there were an election in South Africa tomorrow, you would not vote for the ANC. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a member of the ANC. That doesn't matter. Would you actually vote for them? The, the, the vote is a secret. <laughs> <You're new. laughs> I don't think you're making it much of a secret. I just wonder why you are not happy to I, say to me what is the only rational explanation yeah. for what you've just said, yeah. which is that it would be good for the yeah. ANC to lose an election. Yes. If you think that, then yeah. surely uh, the logical conclusion is you wouldn't well, vote for it. Well, them. I'll try to get it to win, but, uh, you know, I'm dead certain that at the rate at which, uh, you know, it is sliding to the bottom, it may actually lose the elections. That's You that's think for the sure. next national mm. election in South Africa, the ANC may lose? Yeah. That's extraordinary. I mean, you know, no, we're talking about a party which, it's since not, Liberation, has commanded more than 60% of the it's vote. It's not extraordinary. Because political parties are established for a purpose, specific purpose. Maybe the ANC has achieved that. And outlived it. Yes. That's quite something. That's quite something that he's saying there. I mean, I know it's a couple of years ago, but it's doing the rounds again because this is a guy who is still a respected man in the ANC. If this is what he was thinking four years ago, can you imagine what he's thinking now? Because it certainly well, hasn't got better. Well, we don't really have to imagine what he's thinking. For the past three weeks, he's been on the front page of every every one of the newspapers. Scathing, mm -hmm. they say. <laughs> Talking about the disputes, the lists, why they failed to put in the list, why they couldn't pay for it, why they he's been yeah, hmm, Halema man. And in mm. all of it, in all of it, what I find <coughs> so fascinating is the even he is not taking responsibility for why they are here, where they are. He's yeah. Correct. always been an elder. He's always been in leadership positions, at least for the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And he's not saying, well, I fucked up here and here and here. It's the ANC. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's at this stage, I must say, that uh, we as the as the Betty people would not like to be represented by Khalema until he does something good again. So <laughs> let me just, please, let that be on the record. Uh, all right. Well, on the way, we have the burning platform, and that's coming up with Nando's next and Ray Hartley, our guest. Uh, also, if you didn't get to listen to our interview yesterday, that uh, we I think it went live at 8 o'clock yesterday morning. It's a really, really hard interview to listen to, but it's with uh, Glynis Horning. It's about her son who committed suicide two years ago. And she's written this really, really unbelievably eloquent story about how she's dealt with it, how the family dealt with it, what she's gone through, what they what they all have felt. And it could be helpful. It could be useful. It could be interesting. And it could perhaps open doors to the rest of us to understand how difficult these kinds of things are. And obviously, I hope none of that ever happens to anyone who I know. But if and, and when inevitably these things do happen, we have some tools to deal with them. And Glynis was a terrific interviewer, uh, interviewee. Um, she really was um, very open, very honest, very real. And the pain is still very raw with her. And uh, I encourage you to listen to it if you haven't heard it yet, because it's it's really just a very, very moving discussion which uh you know she's she's put into words and and into writing in her book as well it's called water boy a book and uh worth a worth a listen if you haven't listened to it already i got some really good feedback on that from a couple of emails yesterday too all right so on the way the burning platform stick around for that and a whole lot more it is thursday and tomorrow is a public holiday it's heritage day tomorrow This week on Auto Central. First question comes from Juram, who's asked, when you buy a one-year-old car dealership, does the remaining warranty and service plan carry over? Really good question. A really good question, Juram. Um, generally speaking, uh, car's original service plan and warranty coverage should carry through uh, to the to the next owner um, uh, without there being any need for additional warranty or service plan extension. The only requirement is that the car should pass the quality check at the dealership for um, that specific brand and, uh, you okay. know, in your case, uh, Suzuki. So, uh, so just follow up uh, um, um, with the manufacturer. They should have a car in their database and make sure that quality check is done. Catch Auto Central, SA's number one motoring podcast, every Monday at 9 a.m. solutions is key to a great economic quarter. Use the Nando's app to order a quarter chicken with any single side for only 49 rand in just 20 seconds. Nando's. Fire it up. T's and C's apply. That's right. Nando's brings you the burning platform every Thursday morning and today with uh, Pumi Mashiko and I 
and our guest Ray Hartley. He'll be joining us shortly. We'll get into some of the things that uh, Ray wants to talk about in a short while, but there are so many news stories. I promise you the one that we will not be referring to because it's not a news story, even though it's interesting, is uh, Richard Spur's penis picture. We kind of dealt with it. <laughs> We've dealt with that already. We did in the first yeah. hour of the show. Hey. I don't expect us to carry on about that very much more this morning. But there are lots of other stories in the news. If there's anything you'd like us to talk about, you can always let us know. Um, we want to hear from you. You can drop a comment in uh, the YouTube comments. You can also like and subscribe, and we'd appreciate that very much if you are following us on YouTube. Like and subscribe and leave a comment, and then you are part of the family. So the Burning Platform is really our chance every week to catch up on current affairs, to see what's going on in the world, and to discuss the important matters in the political, the economic, and the social realm that affect us all. So Pumi and I are joined this morning by uh, the great Ray Hartley, and I don't say that um, in any facetious manner at all. He really is an incredible really contributor awesome. to South Africa's uh, journalism to us understanding ourselves. And we've been talking to Ray for a while to try and find a day which would work for him. And th I'm thrilled to say he, he can join us this morning. He's obviously a well-known editor. He was an anti-apartheid activist before then in the UDF. Um, he worked at the Human Awareness Program. He's worked as an administrator at CODESA. Um, he also joined Business Day, then the Sunday Times, where famously he edited for a while. He covered the Nelson Mandela presidency traveled the world with him, witnessed the birth of the new democratic South Africa, and since then has written a number of books. He's also been a prominent editor for a number of online and uh, newspaper publications. And he's written, most recently, Ramaphosa, the man who would be king. And we're thrilled to have him with us today. Hey, Ray, how are you? Um, well, how are you, Gareth? Good. It's so nice to see you. And Pumi and I are really excited to have you on because she sent me a WhatsApp a couple of months ago saying, we have to get Ray Hartley on. Because there's so much, so much I want to talk talking, to you man. about. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry. We, we, we're, we're genuinely pleased. And I think so are, are our audience to have you on here. So let's let's get straight to it, Ray. I mean, you've written all these incredible columns over the years. You've written these books, most recently the one about Cyril. So this election that's coming up, um, everybody's looking for someone to predict to be the Nostradamus of the election results. But do you have any immediate feelings? The ANC is in such turmoil at the moment. Everybody is looking at them and going, this is a disaster. But what are the alternatives and, and what are ANC voters going to do when they get to the polls? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a very difficult one. I mean, if you look at it objectively, um, the previous local government election in 2016, the ANC got uh, what you can only call really a snort club. I mean, they lost Nelson Mandela Bay, they lost Chwane, they lost Joburg. Um, and this was in reaction to Zuma and the, the state of the, you know, it was a sort of a protest vote. So there is a tradition of South Africans using the local government elections to send a message. Mm -hmm. However, the question is who would they choose as an alternative? And there, I think it's really difficult to say. And I'm kind of, I, I think people are very distracted by a lot of noise that goes on on Twitter and so on um, about the DA. I suspect they will do better than people think. Mm -hmm. They might not do as well as they could, uh, given the parlous state of the ruling party. I mean, you'd expect an opposition really to solidly kind of advance and, and so on. But I think that at a local level, it's, it's pretty calamitous out there, you know. Um, and uh, you'd have to be a really, really bad opposition party not to pull some of the votes. I think the EFF mm -hmm. will also gain, uh, especially in poorer communities where service delivery is is zero. I mean, it's ground to a complete halt in, in, in most of the country and certainly out there in the Platinum. So there could be a bit of an EFF wave. Um, okay. we, we're looking at a lot of, uh, of hung municipalities where people are going to have to get together. It's coalition politics, you know, squared from last time. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think Cyril's influence on all of this has, or his lack of influence on all of this has been? Because Pumi and I talk about Cyril every week, and 
He's you know, the president. Is, we must. <laughs> I know, but 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 you you've been quite outspoken about this, and sometimes people are are shocked and surprised at how. You know, like Cyril's always shocked and surprised. That's that's <laughs> they're always shocked and surprised that he is. But it seems like this guy is kind of he's languishing a bit. There's there isn't any hard leadership. You know, the one thing you'd say for Zuma, even if we didn't like him, is he held the ANC by the throat and got it to do what he wanted it to do. I don't think Cyril's been able to do that even once. Yeah, I think that's you know, it's just not his style. So I mean, his style is that he will be. I mean, I, I, you know, the sort of metaphor for it, if you could just indulge me for one minute, is mm -hmm. you can imagine Cyril facing his opponent, let's say, Ace Makhashule. Mm -hmm. um, and on the surface, they are hugging, they are smiling, they are shaking hands, they are backslapping, mm -hmm. they are commiserating. But underneath the surface, you've got to picture the roots. And the roots are coming from Cyril are garden shares, and they're, they're cutting off the roots underneath Ace, and Ace withers away. Um, that's how he works. So he doesn't ever want to be seen to be acting against these people in the party. So he cuts off their lines of patronage, and they, you know, they wither away. I mean, Ace has run out of money now. So all mm. the people that depend on Ace for contracts, they no longer get contracts out of the Ace camp. Or... Uh, largesse, you know, patronage. So that then withers away. The trouble with that is that it does not, uh, that is not an electoral message, <clears throat> not a message to South Africa. It's not a clear, decisive path that the voters can see. What they see is muddling along and occasionally something happens and then it seems to take so long. I think in his calculation, I think he expected the judicial process to move a lot faster yes. than it has. So that piece of his puzzle is kind of holding everything back because the prosecutions are, are taking so the prosecution service was so badly destroyed. Um, Unbelievable. And the Zuma. And you, starting before that, uh, that, that just can't get back together. Ray, your description of Cyril is the word you use in your book is ruthless. Yeah. And do you think that he still has that bite and that in the long run, because, I mean, he's always said that he's the president of the ANC before he's the president of the country. Do you think that this is his long game, is his ruthlessness to keep himself available for another term as the president of the ANC and, and possibly at that time be wholly in control of it and, I don't know, do what with it? Yeah, I think that he, you know, I mean, I think he is establishing control. I don't think that's the problem. I just don't think it's his style to sort of forge out that way. I mean, I'm very sort of conflicted about it because if you'd said in let's say 2016, that in five years' time, Jacob Zuma will be in jail, Ace Makhashule will be fired as Secretary General or, or, or suspended as Secretary General and be facing corruption charges. Sure, A senior well, minister uh, like William Kiza would be intermingled with um, great pain. Out of We've lost so much in this devastating, this devastating pandemic. The emergence of new right. technology. Sorry, have we lost you, Ray? Sorry, I just no, lost no, you. Something else going on there. Got, sure. We've got an audio oh. coming through of. Oh, know, that's very Bush, odd. Bush. Sorry, I don't know. I, I don't know where that must have come from. I'm trying to figure. <laughs> I'll try and. I'll try and you figure it out. Larry. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, so so you were talking about about his ruthlessness and and so I, I mean yeah, it, it is pretty ruthless, you know, if you think about it. I mean, the the secretary general of the ANC has been ordered to step down, and is facing corruption charges. Hmm. You know, now that could have been packaged very differently. You know, Ramaphosa could have called a press conference, and he could have announced it and made a a moment out of it, and actually, and then followed it up with, you know, a series of other actions like that. And and he would have got public momentum behind him. But instead, he's sort of like, he wants to be seen to be sort of shocked. You know, well, 
Yeah, you know, it's, well, you know, the courts must take their course, and of course, he's innocent until proven guilty. But we must take these steps, and we hope that the comrade will recover and be back in our ranks soon, and we can all be happy again together. So that sort of message just doesn't play. It just doesn't well, slide. It's not. So, so there's, as I understand it, then there's a bit of performance that goes on in order to give the illusion that the ANC is still a family, even though it's a dysfunctional one at best. And yeah. and then, and then you're applying something which I love to have guests like you on to do because there are very few people who have this ability, is applying the long view of history. Because if you look at things in terms of what you've just brought up now, these are not small moves. I mean we're always wrapped up in the day-to-day -day news, right? So we expect dramatic daily news and we expect the news cycle to have this long tail, but it doesn't really. And it's it's because we, we don't have that perspective of the whole thing. Like the ANC Secretary General is gone, you know, and he yeah. has lost all his power. And as you say, his roots have been cut out from under him. These are significant moves. And we tend to think that because Cyril isn't making these big announcements and doing these dramatic things, that things aren't moving forward, but they clearly are. They are, but, you know, but, you know, 50% of this, of politics is the, is the message and the, the sort of putting the message across and packaging it. And that part is, is not there, you know, it's kind of, it's it, because he, I think he thinks that he needs to work the party um, mm. and keep the party together, uh, you know. And so I think, it, you know, the, the trouble is that it doesn't work when more and more of these things start coming out because the message has not also been sent very clearly within the party. Um, and what do you think this means for, for South Africa, right, for the greater South Africa? So South Africa is not the ANC, but the ANC is the governing party. And so what happens within the ANC has a bigger impact on South Africans and South Africa as a whole. So what do yeah. these little machinations have for the rest of us? What is the implication on the bigger stage? Well, I think the biggest implication is that there's drift. So there isn't a direction carved out and it's not, and in the economic area, there, particularly there is drift because there's there's obviously need for urgent reforms on the economy you know to mm. to really open it up and just let entrepreneurs loose and get uh, some growth going and get um, just fire it up but it's those reforms are are not happening because again they're a negotiation within the party and Ramaphosa doesn't want to alienate the people who are against some of these reforms um, and I think, you know, the thing about the parties, everyone says it's very divided and, and so on, but I, I, there's also a problem that it's, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a homogeneity there in, mm. in cabinet. Um, so right now the president, the minister of finance, the minister of trade and industry yeah. and the minister of minerals and energy, all former general secretaries of Kasati. <laughs> okay, so out of that, you're not going to get dynamic, uh, no. progressive economic reform. You're going to get protect the workers. As oh, is socialists. <laughs> yeah, that's so exactly right. You're, so you you don't have a you know to cover an economic reform direction along the lines of Southeast Asian countries and so on, which you know requires a bold leader to go out there and do something pretty dramatic and overturn the apple cart. The, the, the interesting thing here also is that they, they're, you, we say that the ANC is divided, but they're tremendously loyal to each other in a way that other parties aren't necessarily. You know, they don't disagree with each other publicly very often. And we know that it's very hard to get the ANC to turn on one of their own. Um, it, it takes an enormous amount of negative press and huge damage to the party for people to actually say it's that guy or it's that girl you know we always hear these these murmurs of small anyana skeletons in the cupboards but people don't actually turn on each other in the ANC they, yeah, look at they what's actually happened with Kusela Kusela Tiko 
Dico. Right? We, mm. Yeah. Look what's happened with Kusela, where the whole, all of us, we're we now shocked that she's kind of just slinked her way back, back into in. yeah. Yeah. Right. This is the work. And, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, I mean, that's the problem is that there's always a, a kind of, you'll probably dig deep there and you'll see that the deco, there's links to the royal family down in the Eastern Cape, in parts of the Eastern Cape. There's probably a constituency there that's vital to the ANC somehow. You know, so let's see if we can find something for the comrade. Um, hmm. You know, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if Carl Niehaus can find a way back. I think he's pretty much gone. Um, yeah. Uh I don't think that's he really it. has a constituency at all. Um, yeah. But that's about that's it. Shame. I mean, even, yeah. you know, if you think how long it took for them to actually take action against someone who on a daily basis was yeah. issuing public statements and calling press conferences I mean, and ripping into the party. Mm -hmm. It took them, you know, a good five years to, to finally do something. Ray, as a, as a member of... Um, an alumnus of the media fraternity. What do you make of, because, you know, you raised the Carl Niehaus and, it, and his press conferences and making statements and all of that stuff and the media feeding into his delusions, right? What do you make of the role that the media is currently playing in, in, this, in this muddling along, this malaise that the country is in? Do you think that they they are partly part of the problem? Yeah, you see, I think I mean you also have to define the media because these mm -hmm. days it's not you know newspapers are a small part of the media. I mean, there's a much larger media out there that's completely unmediated, and yeah. it's just somebody exercising an opinion without really seeking any points of view on it or. Um, and so in that environment, I think, you know, populism thrives. It's just, so the media is desperate for attention. It's desperate for clicks. That's the future. The only future really is in uh, online advertising. Um, and that, in order to get that, it's measured very ruthlessly um, based yeah. on the number of clicks, hits that you get, uh, traffic, basically. In order to get traffic, you need to have sensational content. And so, so there's this drive towards, this, the, you know, populism kind of feeds on that and the media feeds on populism. So how, on, that, on that note, what does someone like you do when they're looking for the real story? And I mean, not all of us are journalists who can, you know, go to the ground and, and figure out what's actually happening at the local or community level. And we've got these elections coming up and we're going to see who the good journalists are because they'll be the ones who can actually give us facts that turn out not to be fictions. But how do you get your news? I mean, I'm always curious about speaking to people like you who've been in a position where you know a lot more about South African media and publications than anyone else. What do you trust anymore? Because we're all stuck in the same horrible place between not knowing whether this person is a good journalist or that one's a bad one, this one's captured, that one works for somebody who's got an agenda, that one is, is definitely left-wing, this one's definitely right-wing. Where do you get your info? Yeah, I think I, I try and get my info from primary sources, speaking to people that are in the, that are actually in the world of politics. But also I think that there are still a few media institutions which you can pretty much rely on. I, I think of Business Day, for example. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I trust what I read in Business Day. And I think of the Financial Mail and Rob Rose is the editor there. Yes. And he's pretty fearless. And Financial Mail, I think I, I trust them. Beyond that, I mean, I think it's really look at the byline and I, I won't mention names but you know i look at the byline and i go yeah okay well let, let's this this there could be something yeah or alternatively i don't really trust this um, right but i think beyond that it's quite difficult to to i'm being probably very unfair to a lot of good journalists out there in other publications i mean 
columnists and uh, opinion writers, I think there are excellent ones in, you know, for example, Monty Makanya in City Press um, and Barnum Tomboti in the Sunday Times. Absolutely. Are pretty worth worth reading every every week for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a smaller pool than it should be. Ray, let's just once and for all get your comments on Jacob Zuma and the Constitutional Court, because this is going to be an albatross around our necks for some time yet. Yeah, well, I think the court has made itself clear, you know, and we're a constitutional state and there is no way of wriggling around that. I think Zuma always believed that, you know, when it came down to the, the, the final moments, he would prevail. The sheer weight of his political story and his association with the ANC and his history and and the people that he had appointed, because I think he has a very sort of patriarchal kind of view of society. So he thought mm. that when he signed off on judicial appointments, they owed him something, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. And much to his surprise, Mukweng Mukweng did not owe him anything in that famous judgment where he said, cut yes. the head off the beast or whatever it was. Um, mm -hmm. And and all the other judges have also demonstrated that. So I think he's he seriously miscalculated the strength of the constitutional um, order and, and, and judicial kind of weight. And even the country, I think, was nervous about yeah. whether the you know whether it would actually be seen through and i mean helen zilla i think famously <clears throat> even took it when she shouldn't have that um the decision on the election electoral court ele election uh date was going to the election date was going to be moved because the anc was influencing the judges um and then that very afternoon didn't get moved, which which mm. is a you know a, a strong demonstration because I think the ANC is running from this election as fast as it can or it was, yeah. um, and very much have liked another six months to sort itself out. So I think Zuma victory for the constitution. I have a feeling he's he's really ill, and I don't think it would be great for Zuma to die in jail. It wouldn't be great for Cyril if Zuma died in jail. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it would be good. You know, it, it would play very badly. It would create a whole kind of, you took an old sick man, you put him in jail, he died, and then there's a basis for martyrdom and so on. But do you think he's, do you think hand, he's a, sorry, do you think he's a spent force? I mean, if they if they did release him from jail on compassionate grounds or whatever, or they decided... They were going to continue to try him in absentia and let him just retire and take it easy in, in Gandla. Do you think he's a spent force politically, or do you think he still has some extraordinary influence on particularly the pol politics of KwaZulu Natal? Yeah, I think you put your, your your finger on it there. I mean, it's I think it's shrunk and it's now KwaZulu Natal where he plays. Mm. Um, and that's that's very important for the ANC. And uh, you know. I, I don't think you ever count Zuma out. Um, mm. You know, he was fired as deputy president and um, and faced a, a rape trial and came back and won the ANC presidency. So, you know, he was counted out by a lot of people there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, back back in the day, and they were yes. all wrong. And I, 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 I think he'll still be a force, but is a diminished force again because the access to patronage is just limited you know the, the access to money to his people being in positions where they can actually dole out cash is 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 shrinking but in KZN he's a big player and is very popular on all sides of the 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 political sort of divide in northern KZN um so i've no doubt he would continue to play a role but it's going to be a diminishing and shrinking one ray you have 
a long view of South Africa. You know, it, it, looking back, you have seen this country kind of shift through power bases in, in quite significant ways. When you look at South Africa's population, so South Africans and where we are now, we just got the numbers coming in after the voter registration. Most young people uh, haven't even bothered to show up to vote, to, to register to vote. So there's a good 15 million people that aren't on the roll. The role is shrinking. The voters' role is shrinking. And people are, people are hurtful. Do you think we are um, at the precipice of another big shift in terms of power dynamics in South Africa? Yeah, I think so. I mean, what, what you have is a growing constituency outside formal politics. Um, so I think it's now this more than half of mm -hmm. adults who could vote do not vote, put, put bluntly. So, and the reasons for that, some of them might be happy as Larry and not, you know, but if you look at the other statistics that go with that, in other words, this massive youth unemployment um, and lack of opportunities in the economy and the slowing uh, uh, economic growth picture, the impoverishment of the middle classes, um, it all adds up to these people are outside the system because they don't, they don't, I mean, I saw a very funny thing saying that South Africa suffers from electile dysfunction. <laughs> but basically where you you can't you can't find anyone to vote for. Um, so there's, there, there is a lot of dysfunction in the formal electoral system. And this is not sustainable. I mean, at some point, this turns into um, a sort of rebellion. I mean, it's, it's surprising. It's very surprising that South Africa has not actually sunk a lot further into the, into the mire. Um, and, you know, if you look at Venezuela, I think Venezuela's tipping point arrived a lot, you know, before they had 44% unemployment, if you look at the extended figure, mm -hmm. um, and other countries. But South Africa somehow sort of holds it together for longer than well, it should. Well, I'm curious also about like who the next people on the scene are going to be. Because if we if we do stick to politics the way that we've known it for the last few years, like you could see that the the EFF and the DA are doing a whole lot better to recruit younger people into their 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 hierarchies and into their their machinery. Um, and they they they're doing that fairly well. I'd say certainly uh, if you look at the DA they're trying to bring in younger uh, and particularly younger black people in uh, the EFF has got a young leadership, so they don't need to, you know, immediately replace them with with younger ones yet. But the ANC, I mean, who we got there? Because Fikile Mbalula is still like making a lot of statements here, there, and everywhere when it comes to the election. They lost Malusi Gigaba because he was a dud. Um, but but who else do they have? They're, they're all these old people in the ANC, and they don't seem to have any plan. The youth leaders, even the young ones, are old. Yeah, I mean, even the, yeah. you know, the youth league since Julius Malema left has just floundered and fallen apart. We know the women's league is really just a show. There's nothing else going on there. So who are who are the young political leaders, and is there an independent movement that's starting to come about? We see Malusi, I mean, not Malusi Giga, but um, Musi uh, Mamane trying to to engender the idea of independent candidates as being an important outlet for some of this political steam. Do you see that as a possibility or do you think that that's ridiculous? It's not going to happen. Outside of parties, they can't survive. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the political playing field is is kind of captured in a way. I mean, you have a sister self-perpetuating system. So there are mm. actually quite a lot of government funds that go to political parties based on their support. And I don't have the number off the top of my head, but it's a large number that gets paid to the ANC, for example. And even opposition parties get a fairly substantial amount of money out of the system. Um, and it's very hard to, to start up. So, the, you know, it's the same as the business environment. 
mm -hmm. where you have a lot of old established companies that are protected by a lot of bad practices. And it's very hard to start a business in South Africa and compete with them. In the same way, starting a political party and competing with these old established parties is actually extremely difficult. I think the EFF would have been that party, except that it is tainted. Um, and the second, you know, because of the whole VBS scandal. And VBS so thing, yeah. So, but secondly, the EFF's constituency is that very constituency which is not registered to vote <laughs> outside formal politics. Correct. So the EFF has these huge rallies, but on voting day, they don't come. They're not. As Julia said, they take the t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> they take the t -shirt. Love the t shirt, go to the rally, march through Sandton. And then stay at home when when it's voting day. That's the EFF's problem: is to get its its constituency into formal politics. Mm -hmm. And people are just they don't they're, they're just couldn't be bothered. It, yeah. They see complete dysfunction. There's no hope, and they they don't enter the political the formal political system. But so, the EFF also does not know how to do that. So the EFF, unfortunately, their foundation, having just stolen the playbook from the ANC, but also a dysfunctional one, did not yeah. come into the arena and kind of go, right, this is what we stand for. This is who we want. And this is how we're going to go about recruiting them. They just carried on doing what they always did as the youth league within the ANC and just yeah. now with a different T-shirt. Yeah, I think they don't have a, they don't, they don't present an answer, a coherent mm -hmm. answer. You know, they just present a lot of very sort of scary sounding rhetoric, which makes, you know, a broader constituency unavailable to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they could be a lot smarter and deal with the VBS thing. You know, it's not the leader, although yeah. he has some. It's somebody else in the party. Get rid of them, like, yeah. and and start start dealing with that kind of stuff. Do you um, think the EFF has the opportunity? Because here's the other thing with the EFF right now: it's become a little bit like Bantu Holomisa and UDM, right? It's mm. it's the Julius Malema show. Going yeah, right. into the next general election, do you think that the EFF has what it takes? to change its leadership and give us someone new? Or are they just going to be Julius Malema the following year, Julius Malema but, but, the following year, Julius Malema? It's, it's a bit of a grievance party. I mean, yeah. they, they only exist because they lost their home in the ANC. You know, so they, without that, they don't really have much of a story. Or am I being unfair, Ray? No, I think you're, I think you're spot on. I think what the EFF is really angling for is a political realignment in which the left of the ANC falls out and joins up with them and forms a kind of majority. Um, that's what they're hoping for. But the chances of that happening are diminishing because that faction within the ANC is just being, it's, it's being sort of pruned um, into a little bonsai in the corner there. It's no longer a big mm. part of the NC. It's no longer a 50-50, which way is it going to go kind of scenario. Mm. So, and they're likely to get less and less seats and less and less places in municipalities and provinces and so on. And I don't think that scenario is going to work for the, the EFF. Um, well, I mean, I mean, to date, they don't own it. They own. They don't have the majority in a single ward in the in the country. No, they don't. But I, I think so, they will advance in this election. I mean, having do, said you, that, do you think so? Yeah, I think so. I mean, just out of sheer, sheer sort of um, desperation to vote for somebody else, they will pick up I a think lot people. Of I think South Africans tend to rather not vote than vote for someone else. I think we're going to yeah. see f much fewer people showing up I agree. to the to the voting booth, and and that only serves the ANC. I mean, when less people <laughs> show up, they still have their diehards who will show up. And, and to some um, and to some extent, the DA. I mean, I think the yeah. DA and the ANC are they will benefit from a low voter turnout because yeah. the the people who vote DA will go. And less ANC people 
you know, kind of not pitching at the polls will will give them a larger proportion of mm -hmm. the, the overall votes. So I think the DA and the ANC benefit from this, but not the EFF. I'm with Pumi on this one, Ray. Tell me quickly, because we haven't spoken about COVID at all, and it, it is still yeah. there. I mean, we are still in a state of, what do they call it? Disaster. Disaster. Um, you know, and Kwasa Sanat Lamini Zuma is in charge of this, and we just keep having the state of disaster renewed. And Cyril did us the enormous favor of giving us, what is it, uh, adjusted level two um, permissions the other day. So now suddenly the curfew is at 11 instead of at 10, and you can buy liquor on a Friday. And, you know, all of this is hugely important to us, obviously. But, I mean, I walked around um, the other day in, in a fairly public and crowded place, and I saw only a few people wearing masks, most people shaking hands, most people carrying on. It's pretty much done. And, and you know, vaccines are now available for anyone who wants them. And they, they're rolling them out in places far and wide. To, to their credit, I think, to government and, and private businesses' credit, they've made the vaccines available largely. So surely it's only a matter of time before all of this nonsense must end. And we must actually just get back to a stage where there aren't levels for us to have to comply with like we live in a Dompas world pre-1994. Yeah, I think that, um, I think the problem is that we, the economy has been severely hammered. And, you know, lifting it all now, I'm not sure is, is really going to help because things are very dire out there in the small business territory, certainly, and in the hospitality, restaurant, catering, that kind yes. of industry. Um, tourism, so it's 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 yeah. I I think there there probably is still a concern because we're only at sixteen million with vaccinations. So the the trouble is the sixteen million are pretty I think well protected according to the science, and so mm -hmm. they don't really they would love to get back to normal, but yeah. there's the the other thirty four million that are not vaccinated, um, that would actually suffer enormously. So it's quite a, it's a tricky one. I mean, I, I, well, one argument you could make about South Africa is that we had one of the heaviest lockdowns in the world mm -hmm. um, last year, but we also mm -hmm. then had one of the largest kind of infection and death rates in the world. So, you know, in fact, yeah. we, so, we South Africa's done South Africa's done very little to help the argument for lockdowns as a yeah. result of that. Mm. Yeah. I think, you know, the movement towards a smarter kind of policy where you actually identify who is at risk and you isolate them. I mean, I think at the beginning it, it was known wh what the risk spread was. So you could have said 60s and over, you're locked down. You don't go anywhere. You don't see anyone, no restaurants for you. But did you have to do the same to, you know, 20 to 35 year olds? Correct. Um, who are sort of the backbone of the emerging small, small business economy in the country. Um, yeah. So that, you know, it's very difficult to administer a kind of staggered layered lockdown like that. But I, I think it's also politicians love it because you're on national television, you're the. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you, you, you're demonstrating leadership. You are, you know, everyone must tune in and listen. And then yep. you've got sort of, you can't do that if the situation isn't dire. So you need to kind of paint a picture where the situation is pretty dire. Um, and it is, it is for some people. I mean, it's, it, it is for people who are ex exposed and actually in the hospital and so on, um, but not for everyone. And how you come out of this and start to ease up um, in sections of the economy, in sections of the population, I think is the way forward. So there was a little bit of political theater this week at the White House. Boris Johnson went over to meet Joe Biden, and they're both um, speaking at the United Nations. I think Joe Biden already did that yesterday. But here's a picture of them at the start of the, of the meeting, where they're both uh, wearing their masks. You can see them both sitting and probably, you know, they could probably reach out and touch each other, but they're both wearing the masks. And this is exactly two minutes later where they're not wearing the masks and they're now hugging. And I'm I'm just getting slightly annoyed by 
by this play acting that we're all involved in at the moment. And I want to know what your thoughts are on this, because here are two men who are supposedly, you know, for better or for worse, and God help us if, if it's true in every sense of the word, but these are the supposed leaders of the free world. And they're meeting there and putting on a show. The masks have become a political badge. They've become a kind of secular kefir that people wear now in order to demonstrate that they are on the this, this correct side of an argument, you know. And the anti-maskers and the anti-vaxxers have almost taken on anti-scientific positions just because they hate the politics of the other side so much. You see this more and more. It's not such a big problem in South Africa, but you see it all over Europe and America. I mean, it happens here too. I see, I see um, your face for me. It does happen here too. <laughs> but not did to, you not, not see to the degree. march at Sea Point? <laughs> like America, America seems to be irreconcilable at this stage. There are very, very red states and very, very blue states. And it, it seems to, to be heading in the direction that the union cannot hold. You know, the last time America was this divided was over slavery in the 1800s. Yeah, I mean, I think it's deeply divided. And what what you don't have, and it comes back to your, your question, comments earlier about, say, for example, the media. Who do you trust in the media? Yeah. There is no longer really a sort of somewhere you go to find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's manufacturing their own story and believing it yeah. and sort of cynically believing it in many cases, mm -hmm. just because, as you say, because they politically are in that territory. It almost seems that the more you believe it in the absence of evidence, the more righteous you are. You know, it's, it's, it's like it's become religious. The fervor has become religious. So if I want to demonstrate how much I belong to this tribe or this party, I almost have to disregard all of the evidence to the contrary more vociferously than yeah. someone who's trying to be objective. That's how I prove I'm one of the good people or the bad people. Yeah. But it does point to a sort of major global problem, which is that, you know, who's the headmaster <laughs> um, yeah. in this yeah. crazy <laughs> school where everyone's running around in the passages and not studying? No, it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, there isn't, you know, we used to have a bipolar world with the Soviet Union and, and the United States. Then it became a unipolar, unipolar world when the Soviet Union collapsed. And now it's a non-polar world. And you've got, I think China is going to make a big, strong bid to be that kind of global force. And that's not a good thing. Um, I know it's not fashionable, but... You know, China's China's a bad country in many respects. Um, it does not respect democracy and human rights, etc. Um, and then there are many good things about China. For example, it's the way it's been able to expand its economy rapidly and lift, you know, billions out of poverty in a very short time. And it's got a pretty organized and effective government. Um, but, you know, so there's a there's a kind of there isn't a sort of uh, lodestar for the for the world to look at um, and to actually say, well, this is how we measure ourselves. Well, uh, to, to stick to America for a second, I see that Joe Biden's poll numbers in, in Pew polling just this week are, are for the first time since he's taken over. And remember, he's only been president since January um, are lower than Trump's were at the point where he was uh, unelected at the end of last year. That's quite scary because everybody looked at Joe Biden as being the return to sensible, the return to normal, the, the kind Grown of the up guy in the had, room. Correct. And, and, and now his poll numbers are as low as that, 43% and dropping like a stone. Every time he opens his mouth, it seems he says something else that's more stupid than anything Trump could have said. At least Trump seemed to have been cogent. Joe Biden doesn't even seem to be inhabiting his own brain at the moment. Yeah, I think he's he's struggling. I mean, mm. you know, the alienation of Australia over this nuclear submarine deal, I think, was that's quite a, a... That's a big story, and, and nobody's yeah. really talking about it. Yeah. Um, and obviously the Afghanistan kind of fiasco at, mm. at the end there, although that really was Trump's making. It was Biden who was sitting in the White House when it went down, and that's how... Well, 
he could have changed i mean he had he had months to change the rules and he could have Var various administrations in the past have said you know what we're not honoring that deal here's the new deal this is the new administration's yeah. plan it, it seems kind of ridiculous that this was the government that was going to change things back to normal and then he says well we've got to stick to trump's deadline he didn't have to joe biden yeah. if he'd had any cajones at all he would have said guys no we're going to keep a small it's peacekeeping force deadline. there like we have for the last 20 years and we're going to try and maintain some order instead he was like no nope, got to stick to this because trump said so it's kind of it's not the same as the messaging he keeps giving us everywhere else you know doesn't yeah. make sense to me yeah i think it's i mean there's a loss of leadership taking place there you know it's just kind Jeez. of the world is just going nah you know this is not this doesn't look very and, and, and what about boris i mean boris is a big joke at the moment you know we, we know that Boris is not an uneducated or unintelligent person, but I almost think he was better writing columns for GQ and being a, a public intellectual than he was as prime minister. He's a terrible he prime is minister. A terrible prime minister. Yeah, I know. He, he was a good columnist. There were some of his columns which were a little unfortunate, but yeah, way back in the day. But um, yeah, you know, I think he's kind of, Again, it's the sort of this populist kind of politics that's kind of on the rise. I think Boris is is actually not doing a bad job if you look at the UK in terms of uh, the management of COVID and all that kind of stuff. But mm. you know they've opened up. I don't think you have to yeah. wear a mask in the UK anymore. No, you don't. Um, if you're vaccinated, you as don't. As long as you're right. not from South Africa. <clears throat> yeah. But, you know, a lot of the Brexit things are coming home to roost now, you know, in terms of supplies and getting supplies out of Europe, the trade relationship, et cetera. I mean, there's a danger that they could run out of gas ahead of winter mm. in the UK. Um, and well, that, then, they have to, then they have to beg Vladimir Putin, don't they? Exactly. So, you know, those, those are problems. I mean, I think the Brexit thing uh is gonna really haunt them for a while yeah well that that's also true but this this is a part of the bigger narrative which pumi's brought up a couple of times is the worldwide failure of the left and and how the left is just they've run out of ideas and they're starting to go back and implement old ideas which are not working and all over the world this you could call it populism but it isn't always populism of the right or the left it's sometimes just people in melbourne who are sick of lockdowns you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have a political tone to it, but what it is, is a response to authoritarianism of every kind and a response against the ideas of kind of liberal Western democracy in some ways. This is a failure of the left, an unmitigated failure of the left. What do you think? Yeah, I would, I would agree. I mean, I think that, you know, where has a liberation movement come to power and managed to turn that into very positive development looking around at our own sort of southern african region um it's quite difficult and the reason is that it doesn't translate well into economics so it's a great model for political power achieving it and retaining it for a while against against the odds but it's not a good model on which to construct and grow an economy um and the, I, I think there's a big chunk of the world which is functional and democratic and increasingly democratic and growing economically, which, um, you know, is, is, is ignored. So, you know, if you look at the Southeast Asian countries again, um, yeah. and success. Just be careful. When you, when you refer to the Southeast Asian countries, you've got to be careful because you do sound a bit like Helen Zilla. Be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I work at the Brentus Foundation and we really released a book called The Asian Aspiration, mm. which asked the question, should Africa be following the Asian model? And the answer yeah. is emphatically yes. And if you look at that Asian model, it's, it's, it really has produced kind of a lot of economic dynamism um, and brought a lot of people into the economy and dealt with unemployment um you know so a country like singapore you know singapore actually sent a delegation to kenya in the 1950s to study kenyan economic development because they wanted to 
they wanted to get ahead. Um, that's where Singapore was, you know. Um, and now they just completely dwarf Kenya. And Kenya sends delegations to Singapore to find out, you know, how to, how to ignite economic growth. So they did something right, and there's a model there, you know, and that is you've got to make these very big reform decisions and you've got to move. You've got to what, free what are, So the, the thing about... What are those sorry, reforms? Garrett, uh, sorry, yeah, Pums, you go ahead. I'll, I'll ask no, you ask you a reform question and then I'll... No, so, ask. so I'm curious because, you know, the Brenthurst Foundation, I, I know you guys do excellent work and some of it gets more attention than, than other bits of it. Usually the controversial stuff is the only stuff that gets reported on, which is unfortunate. But in your in your work there and the work that other people at the Brent House, uh, Brent House Foundation do, what have you found to be those ingredients of reform that will speed our economy forward and will stop putting obstacles in the way of ordinary people achieving their economic liberation and achieving their own agency in, in, a, in the world economy? I think the first thing is that you have to have a highly effective technocratic merit meritocratic state. Um, you know, you can't, you will go nowhere with, unless you have the skills, know-how at the top in government. So you have to restore um, technocratic skills and you can't be a fussy about where they come from. So mm -hmm. if you have to bring people back who've gone overseas or whatever, do what you need to do. Um, and then secondly, with that kind of state, you're able then to target the sectors of the economy which are going to grow the fastest and are going to bring the most kind of uh, benefit and actually accelerate the growth there. So it's not, it's not about, um, you know, state intervention's bad when the state is weak and does the wrong things. Mm -hmm. But the state intervention that took place in those Southeast Asian countries um, was good. It was targeted and they actually they aggressively pursued um, uh, attracting the most, most skilled people in the society into the government and they and they built industries and then when the time was right there's those industries were moved into private hands where they could be sustainably and you know economically functionally go you know go forward with them so there's a you know in south africa we're we're stuck because we have a state that's incompetent. I mean, it's yeah. Um, okay, there, so are, then, there are a lot of people who do good in the state. Again, let me just say, I mean, yeah. it's not everybody, but we've lost quite a big sort of technocratic layer. I mean, if you think of ESCOM, you know, ESCOM lost its engineering capacity and its project management capacity in the 1990s. And the consequences in the 2000s were Severe, so, and we're still uh, living. With no. it. Mm. So, so then the the question, you know, you talk about kind of big changes in in the the level of government, and what I'm also interested in, and maybe it's a good place to be the last thing that we talk about, is what are the the changes that individuals? What is it that individuals within our society? So anybody listening today, what what can each one of us do differently to <coughs> move? forward because yeah we know yeah. our state is weak and our state is incapacitated in a lot of ways but we still have some kind of autonomy and and liberty to do some things yeah and i think first you know vote wisely um would be the first thing <laughs> so that's that's the primary way in which you can actually influence the direction the political direction of the country but i think secondly it's um to try and sort out local level um, yes. governance. You know, uh, that's where it all begins. So, you know, do you have a residence association? Are you a member of it? Do you support it? Do you work with them to influence the council to sort your area out, to sort your services out, to deal with the potholes in your streets? Yeah. That's where it begins, I think. Actually, uh, you know, where you can make a change, you know, where you live and um, what you encounter every day is probably the, the strongest way to begin. 
And and what an opportunity we have to do all of that and to do the first thing you suggested, which is to use our votes wisely in the upcoming elections. So we've got a month or a month and a half to prepare ourselves and to be propagandized if we're unfortunate, um, but mostly to make our own minds up and to decide who we want to to have in positions of not particular glory and 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 power and and huge money. I mean, local and municipal politics is is a messy affair and it's not glamorous in any which way but, uh, it's about but, service. but, but that's where the real the, the activity really happens and where the the, the the people make themselves counted so let's do this ray i'm going to take your advice and i think we should all um it's great to have you on the show thank you so much for coming to join us this morning and uh, we appreciate your time keep doing the good work that you do at the brent house brent house foundation and uh, keep writing occasionally for for those publications where you've said that you don't mind your name being associated, because <laughs> we'd love to hear from you. It's always good to have your input. Thank good you so much. Good to see you again. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Cheers. good. There's Ray Hartley. That is the burning platform for this morning with me and Pumi and you, and we will see you tomorrow. Oh, no, we won't tomorrow. Tomorrow's a holiday. Woohoo! So we're off tomorrow. So there's no show here. We will see you on Monday. Okay, make sure you put that in your diary. Six o'clock Monday. Have a good long weekend, everybody. Happy Heritage Day. Cheers, Pums.